think I had a 50-50 shot of coming back out. Since the COVID pandemic began, many patients have been prescribed legal medicines only to find they can't get them filled because a pharmacist stepped in to say no. How did they tell you that? Was it the pharmacist himself on the phone? Yes. And I heard her say, you can't do that. You can't just not fill a prescription. This week, the power to prescribe. As America moves into what is likely a long campaign for president in 2024, there are reasons to re-examine concerns from 2016. How successful has Putin been in sowing disinformation in American society? Very successful, um, astonishingly successful. But in this new information age, Russia is just one player in a new Cold War. Outrage over members of Congress getting rich on insider information led to restrictions on their investments. But now an investigation finds the same rotten practices for profit being used by officials on the federal payroll. One in five federal officials who we looked at were investing in companies that they regulate. We speak with The Wall Street Journal's James Grimaldi on his investigation and an historic low in public confidence. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. With the worst of the COVID nightmare hopefully in the rearview mirror, there are lingering policy questions that will be addressed for years to come. One important issue surrounds who controls medicine that could be harmful or life-saving, depending on whose opinion you get. During COVID, thousands of people with legal prescriptions found their medicine blocked by the local pharmacy. Today, we hear both sides in the debate over medical freedom. In October of 2021, Bill Salier and his wife got seriously ill with COVID. When they couldn't get treated quickly in person, they were among the millions who consulted a doctor online. She told me that I was about to go critical and she believed within 48 hours I would be headed to the hospital. And she thought at that point I had a 50-50 shot of coming back out. But she also said, that's the scary news. The good news is we can turn this around for you. The doctor's recommended treatment included steroids, vitamin D, and ivermectin, an FDA-approved drug long used in people and even longer in animals to fight worms and parasites. The ivermectin was the one that I think, combined with the steroids, was going to be kind of her punch on it. That's my thought. Trying to find current drugs that may work on new viruses is a well-endorsed strategy since it's faster than inventing new medicines. Just two months earlier, an analysis in the American Journal of Therapeutics looked at 15 studies and concluded that ivermectin reduced the risk of COVID death and large reductions in COVID-19 deaths are possible using ivermectin. The apparent safety and low cost suggest that ivermectin is likely to have a significant impact on the COVID pandemic globally. But the reviews and messaging on ivermectin were mixed. CDC issued a warning saying the drug could make some people seriously ill and reported a rise in ivermectin calls to poison control centers. And there was a media campaign to discourage its use. There's a surge in demand for a drug that is often used to treat worms in animals as a false cure for COVID-19. In the small town of Albert Lee, Minnesota, where the Saliers live, Two pharmacies refused to fill the Salier's ivermectin prescription. That included the local Walmart. How did they tell you that? Was it the pharmacist himself on the phone? Yes, it was. It was the pharmacist himself, and he talked to my wife because I was kind of incoherent. And I remember her walking into the bedroom, and she was so upset. And I heard her say, you can't do that. You can't just not fill a prescription because you feel like you don't want to. And I could hear her responding to his answer of, yes, I can, and I won't fill it. And she continued to try and argue the case, but it was, it was a losing case. Pharmacists do have the right to use their professional discretion to turn away prescriptions. But ivermectin proved more than a fringe hope promoted by a handful of doctors. According to CDC, by November of 2021, more than 377,000 people a month were being prescribed ivermectin, 
a 24-fold increase compared to before COVID. Nobody we spoke to could point to an instance prior to the pandemic where so many people were blocked from getting legally prescribed medicine. The mass refusals have sparked a national debate over patient rights and whether pharmacists should overrule a doctor's judgment. To have that denied, especially when our physician contacted them directly and said, this is the correct prescription, this is the correct dosage, you need to fill this for my patient, and no was the answer, I won't do this. In fact, it even ended up with our doctor becoming more firm and saying, no, you, you need to fill this, and the pharmacist at Walmart hung up on her. So you Bill Salier says he turned to desperate Walmart measures. Being a farm boy, I mean, I've been around ivermectin all my life. I've been giving it to livestock for, well, gosh, since I was 10 years old. So we were very familiar with it. He consulted their doctor and their veterinarian, translated the horse formulation into a human dosage, and... We squirted horse paste into applesauce and down the hatch it went. Fortunately, Salir and his wife did not get sick after taking what they call pony paste, quite the opposite. And astonishingly, now, granted, yes, the steroids were in use and, and some of the other things too, but my wife only had the ivermectin. Four hours later, she was turning around. Eight hours later, I walked out of the bedroom for the first time. And my children cheered. It was remarkable. I, I could tell I was winning. Salir felt so strongly about his experience, he sued Walmart and the grocery store. The judge dismissed the case. Salir is appealing. It was take the gamble or die, which is the point of the, the lawsuit. They're putting us in a situation where we're holding hands and praying and taking vet medication because they will not fulfill the, the prescription that the doctor writes. And then in, in my own way of thinking or pattern of thinking, essentially they're practicing medicine without a license. So they are not physicians. And to be able to step in and deny me the health care that my physician had prescribed that's, that's unethical. And to me, that just needed to be brought to a halt. The judge who tossed out Salir's claim said in part, virtually every medical and governmental authority to address the issue has said that ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine should not be used to treat COVID-19. Walmart declined our interview request, but told full measure, our pharmacists have exercised their professional judgment and we stand behind them. We asked if anyone from the federal government urged Walmart to reject the prescriptions. The company declined to answer, citing the ongoing case appeal. Has something like this happened before on this scale? To my knowledge, no. Andrea Sikora is a highly credentialed intensive care pharmacist who says the unprecedented prescription rejections were proper. I think that there is sometimes a misconception that you're going to go in and get this prescription filled and the pharmacist's job is really just to make sure that the correct pills are in the correct bottle and they go to you. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. But a, th a key thing to understand is that a pharmacy is, is not like a waffle house. A pharmacist is not a short order cook. So you don't just show up and say, hey, I want, you know, waffles and sausage and then they give that to you. You actually have someone who's providing you a cognitive service as a medication expert. It could be argued that the people who see their physician that's a much closer relationship in terms of what the physician knows about that patient's particular problems and needs versus the pharmacist who fills the prescription. Why should the pharmacist be able to overrule what the doctor decided? I think it's a good point that to realize that um, most providers get two or three semesters of drug training in their training compared to four years in a doctor of pharmacy degree. Many pharmacies did fill ivermectin prescriptions. One of them told Full Measure that he examined the many studies, believes ivermectin is effective against COVID, and that his own family has taken it. But somebody had to step up to do the fight. Whichever way Salir's appeal turns out, it's clear the COVID experience has raised new conflicts over what some argue is a matter of safety and Salir sees as restrictions on medical freedom that forced him to look for a miracle. The pharmacies didn't exactly come through on that miracle, but that uh, farm boy spirit did, and my wife and I did the pony paste, and I, I believe I am here because of that decision. 
We ask, but nobody from the government is tracking the number of people supposedly helped or hurt by ivermectin and other such therapies. Ahead on full measure, Cold War propaganda strategies as we head for the next election. Today, the Cold War echoes through the war between Ukraine and Russia. Espionage, propaganda, and election meddling were hallmarks of the conflict with the former Soviet Union. But as Lisa Fletcher found out, what's old is new again in growing tensions between the U.S. and Russia. Hundreds of social media accounts, including this fake Tennessee Republican Party Twitter profile, were created ahead of the 2016 elections by Russians, intent on manipulating voters, according to federal investigators. They say posts like these contained false information meant to expand divides among presidential political supporters. How successful has Putin been in sowing disinformation in American society? Before uh, the war in Ukraine, we would say uh, very successful, um, astonishingly successful. Um, at this point, um, we are all expecting him to try to sow disinformation uh, again in the U.S. One of his close associates said that, yes, we have meddled in the past and we will med continue to meddle uh, in the future. Calder Walton studies the past and present of interference tactics here at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. There are echoes of a new Cold War right now between uh, uh, the West and Russia. And a lot of the tradecraft that was pioneered in the 1950s and 60s about spies and spying, espionage and counter-espionage is still very active today. Like Russian spy conspirator Anna Chapman, whose cover was a TV personality and catwalk model. Russian agent Maria Butina posed as a journalist, but was actually infiltrating U.S. organizations and influential conservative political circles. And fake billionaire heiress Anna de Rothschild, suspected of being a Russian spy. She infiltrated former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home and is now being probed by the FBI. In the old Cold War, it all seemed very pedestrian. The Soviets would concoct a forgery. They would plant it in some Soviet-friendly press with the aim of discrediting the United States. Well, now with social media, for people that were trained in disinformation, like Putin himself, a former KGB officer, social media was just a golden opportunity, and he exploited it. What gives disinformation the credibility now that allows so many people to buy into it? Any kind of covert action will only be effective if it amplifies existing grievances in a society. If you come along and just make up a big lie, generally that's not going to work. It's much more effective to build on existing fears and it disseminates um, around the world at lightning speed. The KGB tried to do everything possible to prevent Ronald Reagan getting a second term. They tried to orchestrate rallies um, against uh, Reagan. They tried to recruit agents in either um, political parties to run against Reagan. They hated Reagan. They were more scared of, of Reagan than anybody else on the planet. Walton says the U.S. has had its hand in meddling as well. The U.S. interfered in elections in the past, uh, undisputably. In 1948, the CIA proudly interfered in the Italian elections to prevent, as they saw it, the intrusion of Soviet subversion. They were trying to promote um, democratic candidates against communist candidates. But in the war between Russia and Ukraine, the tables have turned. President Putin and his operatives are widely seen as losing the information battle. The U.S. declassified intelligence about Putin's invasion plans to ward off doubt by U.S. allies and form a united front. The U.S. and the British did an absolutely astonishing job of declassifying in real time intelligence that they had about Putin's ambitions for a so-called false flag, an excuse, a pretext to launch his invasion. And by going public with that, they um, uh, minimized Putin's chances um, for maneuvering. We kind of inoculated his excuse to go for war and the information warfare battle space within Ukraine has not gone according to his plan ever since. 
Walton says he hasn't seen anything recently that's of the scale of Russia's 2016 meddling in the U.S., but that shouldn't give anyone reason to relax. How likely is it that there are foreign agents among us actively spreading disinformation to create strife here in America? Are there people in the U.S. that are being used by foreign actors, Russia, China, Iran, um, to spread disinformation? Yes, definitely. What issues do they think that Putin's operatives are likely to exploit in the near future? Probably oil and gas. Walton says as inflation bites and oil and gas prices continue to rise, that is going to provide a tinderbox for Russian disinformation. It's probably going to go in the direction of us being able to take care of our own, like keeping the heat on in winter. An old game, but yeah, we're starting to recognize when that's happening. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. When we come back, you may be surprised to learn how many federal officials invest in the companies they regulate. If you followed it on the news, you know members of Congress and judges have gotten dinged in the court of public opinion for having personal financial stakes in companies they have professional influence over. Now the Wall Street Journal's reporting sleuths have turned their attention to top federal officials. They built an original database of financial disclosures, and as senior reporter James Grimaldi tells me, the resulting analysis raises a lot of questions. We were surprised by the bottom line, which found one in five federal officials who we looked at were investing in companies that they regulate. What are they supposed to disclose? Well, they're supposed to disclose all of their assets, what they're investing in, what companies or mutual funds or ETFs that they were investing in. I assume the rules might be different depending on the agency, but are these officials prohibited from having interests in companies and matters that they may have to regulate or be involved in? No. Uh, they're allowed to invest in the companies up to $15,000 uh, on an actual stock. And if it's a mutual fund, say an energy mutual fund, and you worked at the Department of Energy or the EPA, you can have up to $50,000. So they're allowed to invest. Now, specific agencies, as you point out, may have more rigorous requirements. For example, the Food and Drug Administration requires that you must not invest in companies that they determine are significantly regulated organizations by the FDA. And the FDA is great. They actually have a list uh, that they publish that anyone can look at uh, monthly uh, about what comes and goes. Because, you know, you could be Johnson & Johnson and have, uh, you know, a, a things that are not regulated or General Electric makes a lot of other things, but also makes medical devices. They have a very complicated formula, but they make it easy for the employees to be able to look. And we still found an official, a top official at the FDA who had multiple investments, 70 companies, 170 transactions, just for the years we were following his disclosures. Who was that? That was Malcolm Bertoni. He was the director of the Office of Planning at the FDA. And like a lot of other officials, he would say, well, it was an investment of my wife and or my third party investor. But that's not the rule. The rule says you have to know what you're, what you're investing in and you're supposed to avoid it. There was one official in the Environmental Protection Agency, which was working in an area that was engaged in loosening air pollution rules and the Trump administration was deeply invested in energy companies. And when we asked about that, like, well, what's going on here? And he said, well, that's really my husband uh, and my husband's uh, investment advisor. Did that violate any rules? I don't think it violated per se the rule because it was under the $15,000 uh, allowance. It's just, it, it just the timing looked bad. If somebody has been found to have broken their agency's rules in the past, what happens to them now? Generally nothing. I mean, we looked through these reports that go to the Office of Government Eth Ethics, and we couldn't find any cases in which there was someone who was directly uh, prosecuted uh, for having violated this rule. You know, I think people are feeling very jaded when they look at their federal servants and agents and maybe those in the courts too as to whether they really do have to follow the same types of rules you would expect people to follow in private industry. 
Well, I do think that public confidence in many of our governmental entities and agencies are really at sort of a historic low. And it, it really behooves, I think, the federal officials and others to try to be, you know, purer than Caesar's wife, as they say, uh, above the fray. And I will add that we did see lots and lots of federal officials who, when they came into government, divested of their individual holdings and went into mutual funds and ETFs. So there are a lot of good people in government who are trying to do the right thing, but like in any, any barrel of apples, you're going to find some that aren't. And this one in five owning, owning stock in a company uh, in which they're overseeing or, or regulating is concerning. Grimaldi says there have been proposals in Congress to toughen the rules for federal officials, judges, and members of Congress themselves. After a break, an update to our reporting on Social Security cheating Americans. An update to our report on a Social Security Administration whistleblower. We told you how John McAdams exposed the agency was victimizing elderly widows and unwilling to pay them money they'd been systematically cheated out of. It could be men, but it's typically women who applied for survivor benefits and their claims were set up incorrectly. And as a result, they've lost money for years and they continue to lose hundreds of dollars every month. Now two more Social Security whistleblowers have come forward, this time senior attorneys from the agency's Office of Inspector General. They're speaking out about the backlash they say they faced for exposing large improper fines levied against poor, disabled, and elderly people. That according to the Washington Post. The attorneys were removed from their jobs and ultimately reinstated with the agency's questioned practices halted. But they say they've been denied meaningful work since their return and continue to be marginalized for speaking out. The Social Security Inspector General's office declined comment. Coming up next week on Full Measure, an eye-opening report about bias in the newsroom. Find out what happened when an employee at Reuters tried to correct the record about the news agency's reporting on the Black Lives Matter movement. What was the response you got? Just as I had feared, <laughs> the response was incredibly angry, you know, personal attacks directed at me, but also like highly racialized attacks. They told me I was confused and laughable, I was a troll, I wasn't even worth attempting to have a con uh, an intelligent conversation with. They actually even compared me to a sympathizer of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, it just got incredibly nasty. Is racial bias driving false narratives at news organizations? That's next week on Full Measure. If you want to hear more stories, check out our podcast, Full Measure After Hours. You'll hear some more of our reporting and get a peek of some of the behind the scenes work that we do. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.